Hi friends, good evening and once again welcome to the Learn from the Legend series. It's an international Bhai webinar series conducted by the Neonatology chapter of Indian Academy of Pediatrics, National Neonatology Forum Kerala chapter, IAP Trishur and Trishur Neonatology Forum. Myself, I am Dr. Murli Rajan, I am the President of Trishur Neonatology Forum. As we know, it is a 24th episode of the webinar series that is the Learn from the Legends. Today we have a true legend in the field of neonatology that is other than Professor Daniel D. Luca from Paris, France. I welcome you, Professor Dan Professor D. Luca. Welcome, sir. And today we have two eminent neonatologists from India who needs no introduction to all the pediatricians and neonatologists, none other than Professor Siv Sajan Saini from PGA Chandigarh and Professor Mangal Paradi from Institute of Child Health, Madras Medical College, Chennai. Welcome, moderators. Once again, I welcome all the delegates and wish you a very happy learning experience. Over to the moderators. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Murli. Uh, today we are, uh, good evening, everyone. Today we are having a very important, I must say, tax-heavy uh, topic uh, to discuss this evening. Uh, one of the most, uh, and the topic is ultrasound guided surfactant therapy. One of the most important area of research in 21st century has been early respiratory stabilization of neonates. Uh, we have gradually transitioned from invasive ventilation to non-invasive ventilation for preterm neonates, uh, giving less invasive surfactant therapy and uh, giving you know, universal surfactant to extremes of prematurity to uh, targeted surfactant therapy using oxygen targets. Uh, technology has further enabled us to to choose uh, uh, the right candidates by minimizing radiation in form of X-ray by using ultrasound to select the neonates for surfactant therapy. Uh, this technique, which is known as ESTHER, echocardiography uh, guided surfactant therapy has been pioneered by Professor T. Luca and his group. And in past uh, several years, they have given a very high quality publication on this topic. So uh, today we are very fortunate to have uh, Professor D. Luca with us who will enlighten us uh, about this wonderful technique. So may I request uh, Professor Mangala Bharati to introduce uh, Professor D. Luca to the audience and we can start there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarjan. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. It may be good morning or afternoon uh, for uh, many of you. Anyway, good day. Uh, it's a pleasant duty for me to introduce uh, Professor Daniel uh, D. Luca, uh, who has uh, such an illustrious career and is a renowned uh, neonatologist. Uh, so, uh, uh, Professor Daniel Diluca is currently a Chief Division of Pediatrics, Transportation and Neutral Critical Care in the Paris Ecla University Hospitals uh, Medical Center. And he is also an Associate Professor of Neonatology uh, at South Paris Medical School, uh, Paris, Ecla University. He is a member of the research team, INSERM unit, uh, Physiopathology and Therapeutic Innovation of the Paris Ecla University. Uh, he also holds various positions, like he is the president-elect of European Society for Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care, is a member of the Vatican Lancet Commission on the Value of Life. Uh, he uh, is the editor of European Journal of Pediatrics, associate editor of Respiratory Research, uh, president of uh, ADR in Paris, the chair of Clinical R&D Advisory Board, uh, KC Pharmaceuticals, uh, Italy, chair of uh, the Launch Congress, Lung Ultrasound for Neonates and Children, He's an external member of the Department of Infection and Epidemiology, Bronchial Diseases Team of uh, Institute Pasteur, Paris, France. Uh, he got his MD graduation from uh, the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart Medical School uh, at Rome. And uh, from the same institute uh, in 2003, uh, he had a postgraduate master in pediatric emergencies. And in 2004, uh, he had his postgraduate master in neonatal pulmonology and 2007 he got the fellowship certification in pediatrics and in neonatology. Uh, from the European Society for Neonatology, he is certified on the training course in neonatal medicine between 2005 to 2007 and he holds an advanced certification of neonatal pediatric fiber bronchoscopy airway physiopathology from the Italian Society for Neonatology and Italian Society for Pediatric Respiratory Diseases. And uh, his PhD degree, he holds a PhD in biochemistry and clinical molecular uh, biology uh, with an excellent grade from the medical school uh, A. Emily Rome. And uh, he also uh, 
is an uh, associate professor of uh, pediatrics and holds uh, also diplomas in management hospital management and uh, uh, is a national scientific habilitation as full professor of pediatrics in 2017 his primary research areas of interest are in surfactant catabolism and development of surfactant protection sorry surfactant catabolism and development surfactant protection clinical development of point of care ultrasound in nacu and pacu uh, new ventilator strategies like nava and uh, nasal high frequency for pediatric and neonatal forms of respiratory failure is interested in epidemiology of neonatal and pediatric ards and has also a special interest in development of clinical management of uh, neonatal jaundice so he has published uh, uh, more than 200 papers uh, most of them in very uh, prestigious uh, journals uh, he has publications in lancet lancet respiratory medicine lancet child health uh, uh, ajr ccm european respiratory journal pediatrics jama pediatrics intensive care medicine critical care journal of clinical pharmacology and so on and he has also authored nine, uh, 19 between monographs and chapters in the books and he has wrote the introduction of three monography and gave more than 200 presentations to international meetings and congresses and uh, has been awarded the acta pediatrician young investigator award in 2007 italian national award for neonatal research in 2010 espr young investigator award in 2010 and the bent robertson award for surfactant research in 2008 been the deputy chair of respiratory section of the european society for pediatric and neonatal intensive care since 2011 to 2016 in october 16 he has been elected as uh, espn ic secretary he also serves as european society for pediatric research scientific content manager and espr officer for accreditation european society for pediatric research since 2013 he has been referee for several major international journals in the general medicine critical care and pediatric field he also served as referee for several national and international grant programs and he has Uh, received uh, various grants from various uh, prestigious uh, institutions so uh, we are very happy to have you here uh, uh, professor uh, daniel deluca and uh, 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 your i think your resume is endless we are, i think uh, so we don't want to waste more time on your uh, resume we are very eagerly awaiting uh, your lecture on this uh, on, uh, very uh, uh, innovative and interesting topic so over to uh, professor daniel Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, kind presentation. I don't know if you see my slides. Can you see my slides? They yes, sir. Yes, sir. We we can hear. It. Uh, see you. Okay. Hello. Um, Please make it in the view mode. Uh, so yeah, perfect. You uh, you asked me to talk about Esther, and that's a very nice um, and that's a very nice idea because it's an innovative technology. That is going to change um, surfactant world actually uh, much more than others. You mentioned Lisa and others, uh, which I don't believe it at all, and uh, for where I have a lot of um, doubts and and worries about. So let me let me tell you something about this uh, language ultrasound guided surfactant administration. First of all, as you know, I have some uh, conflict of interest because I'm working in surfactant field with many companies for many years uh, right now. And uh, I want you to remember from the beginning that we have two types of guidelines right now. There are the so-called European guidelines that actually suggest to use CPAP from the delivery room and then to um, uh, administer surfactant as soon as possible according to FIO2 levels. So we'll tell you that uh, this choice of FIO2 level is not very much evidence-based and uh, we will go over that. And this is what European guidelines suggest. Then we have the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines that essentially say the same thing. So um, uh, first CPAP and then surfactant according to the clinical situation, but they don't give any particular FIO2 threshold. So if we look in detail at the European guidelines, you see that they say that it is recommended that a threshold of FIO2 more than 0.30 is used for all babies with a clinical diagnosis of RDS. But first of all, there is absolutely no strong evidence behind 0.30 and a clinical diagnosis of RDS means nothing because RDS is a syndrome and it's consisting of signs of respiratory failure that are actually shared with many other uh, causes of respiratory failure and not only with primary surfactant deficiency. So we need something. We need something absolutely 
to identify the baby with a primary sulfatan deficiency. And it's not FiO2 more than 0.30 or 0.40 or whatever you want that is actually telling you that. Going more in details, these guidelines were based on a unique retrospective single center core study, which has been done in Australia, as you may see here, and published in Unitology 2013, where the FiO2 more than 0.30 or one hour of life was more or less uh, predictive of later surfactant needs. And you see here that the area under the cube was, zero, was more or less 0 0.83, 0 0.80, more or less. This was for smaller babies, and this was for babies uh, between 29 and 32 weeks gestation. But the principle is the same. You are using FiO2 only in a retrospective single center, and especially we don't have to forget physiology. We don't have to forget physiology, and we have to remember that oxygenation is not FiO2. Oxygenation is something much more complex, and I'll try to explain to you. First of all, let's have a look at this review. You see here four babies, right, with um, uh, the saturation displayed here, you see 88, but in the reality, in the blood, in the arterial blood, you're gonna have 86. And then you ended up in having an arterial hypoxia with very low arterial oxygen total content uh, because the baby has never been transfused. There's a lot of fetal hemoglobin, which means that at the tissue level, you are not gonna be able to oxygenate the tissues very well. But then there is another baby. We actually has the same saturation, but at a postdoctoral level. So that's already a first difference. Was being transfused, so half the fetal hemoglobin level. And you see that the total oxygen content is much better. It's, more, it's almost twice than the uh, previous example. Although the saturation was, very, was exactly the same. And then we have another two that um, are measuring um, uh, a saturation which is slightly higher but since I've never been transfused, but this is a predactal, you are gonna have a good, a pretty much good um, uh, um, tissue oxygenation. And then another one, which conversely has been transfused many times, uh, we ended up, we ended up, who ended up in a, in, a, in a tissue hyperoxia. So this already tell you that it's not only about saturation neither, you can have a good tissue oxygenation, you can have a tissue hypoxia, and you can have a tissue hyperoxia, if you only look at saturation, if you only look at the FiO2. So why so? Because we have a big problem with fetal hemoglobin that has been a little bit forgetting. So fetal hemoglobin is there and it's very much variable. And we have to go back to these data uh, who are very old, uh, published in journal of clinical investigation in the seventies, but there are any way absolutely valid. You see in premise from 26, and then in term babies up to 42 weeks, how variable is the fetal hemoglobin content? And then the fetal hemoglobin is also going down, going down um, in, in, the, in the first weeks of life. So now fetal hemoglobin is something measurable with a more accurate um, uh, blood gas analyzer. And you can have an idea. And it's not something you can forget because this is actually impacting significantly on your tissue oxygen delivery. So let's have a look at a couple of babies. Uh, just to, to give you a practical idea. So far, I told you that FiO2 is not enough. Saturation is not enough. You don't have to forget fetal hemoglobin, right? So now let's have a look at these two babies. Both have an FiO2 of 40%. Both have a saturation of 95%. And both have a, a, a CO2 transcutaneously measured of 50. So you would say that they are exactly the same. And I... I'm giving you much, many more details compared to what I, I said before, because I'm giving you the saturation, the FiO2, and even the carbon dioxide level. But actually, these two babies are profoundly different, because if you go on, you'll discover that one has six centimeters of water of PEEP, and 45% of oxygen and an oxygen. And the last one is a baby with a severe respiratory failure under ECMO. So you see how complex is oxygenation and how many variables are actually influencing oxygenation. And you pretend to evaluate oxygenation with just one of them, that is FiO2. 
not only that, all these variables and the fetal hemoglobin that I mentioned and others that I, I'm not going to mention today are really interlinked between them. So when you change one of them, this is going to impact on the other ones. So oxygenation is a complex physiological problem and we, uh, we don't have to simplify it. Otherwise, we're going to pay the risk uh, to do some very big mistakes. So I uh, challenge you with another clinical situation. Here on the left, we have a baby, namely Tommy. And on the right side, we have Laura. That's another baby, right? Both of them have exactly the same type of nasal CPAP, okay? But as you may see here, Tommy has seven centimeters of water of CPAP at 30% of oxygen with a good saturation. And Laura has five centimeters of water of CPAP and 45% of oxygen with, again, a good saturation. According to European guidelines, Laura should receive surfactant while Tommy should stay in CPAP. Is that true? Who's the sickest? You cannot actually judge who's the sickest only by looking at the FiO2. There are complex oxygenation metrics that can be calculated that will tell you um, a little bit more accurate picture because in this calculation, you include also the mean wave pressure, you include the PAO2 or the saturation and so on. And I calculated all of them for you here on the left and on the right. And this has been just published in Neonatology. You can have a look. And you see that according to all these um, complex oxygenation metrics, sometimes Tommy is the sickest one and some other times Laura is the sickest baby. So for example, if you look at the alveolar arterial gradient, that's Tommy, the sickest one that's so applied for respiratory index and, um, and uh, the alveolar, the arterial alveolar ratio, while for the PF ratio, they are equal and so on. So you see, um, again, the situation is much more complex. These types of um, oxygenation metrics are always used in PQ and adult as you care. There is absolutely no reason not to use them in neonates. Uh, uh, the only problem is that um, uh, sometimes we need an arterial line and this is not feasible, but you can do that, for example, with transcutaneous PAO2 measurements, uh, which is pretty much accurate. And there are also guidelines to use them, or you can use the SF ratio or the oxygen saturation index, which are not perfect, but anyway, are going to be more accurate than just looking at the FiO2. It's not ending here. There is also another factor. Remember here, seven of CPAP and five of CPAP, but actually in the real life, what we ask it to the machine is not actually the delivered CPAP. We studied this um, quite accurately in many babies, and we measured in my NICU the pharyngeal pressure of babies receiving, for example, variable flow CPAP and, and continuous flow CPAP. And you see here that the, um, uh, the, there is a pressure leak, and there is a pressure leak uh, because the mouth is more or less invariably open, unless you use some chin strap. And these leaks are more or less 40% of the applied pressure. And if you do the same measurements in other forms of more advanced non-invasive respiratory sports, like, non, like nasal HFO or biphasic CPAP or nava NIV, that's more or less the same, around 30%, which is a significant pressure leak. So basically, you think to give the baby six centimeters of water, but it's getting three or four. And this is something that must be also remembered. This also represents a good news because at the end of the day, it means that when it comes to primary surfactant deficiency in babies that actually received correct and complete antenatal steroid prophylaxis, you need not so much CPA pressure in order to stabilize the lung. Something that is not so high may uh, be uh, enough to stabilize the lung, but then you have to measure that. So now it comes the, uh, the, the very big question for clinicians at the bedside. If you look at this meta-analysis, both in terms of mortality and in terms of chronic lung disease, surfactant is more efficacious if it's given in the first three hours of life, right? So three hours may be a long time, but it's actually very short. So you go out from the delivery room, eventually your baby already gets, already got a prenatal steroids very well. And in three hours, you need to decide if you stay in CPAP or you go for an ensure. We, don't, we do not do LISA, but anyway, the principle is the same. Three hours to decide if you got to go for a sulfatan injection or not. So Yali membrane disease, meaning RDS due to primary sulfatan deficiency, 
is an homogeneous disease. And it's uh, fantastic to see how this is homogeneous at the Lang ultrasound. So this is to be to, to give credit to the first one, uh, Dr. Copetti and Caterossi, who actually described that 12 years ago for the first time in the world. And you see that all over the uh, lung zones, you have these um, vertical lines coming down from the pleura that are very much confluent, and the lung is completely white, which depicts an alveolar appearance and, uh, and a completely uh, non aerated lung. So this appearance is all over the chest. There are no spared areas at all. And it is really important to realize that this is the counterpart of what is happening in experimental primary sulfatan deficiency. For example, these are pretem lamps delivered at 128 days gestation, which accounts for more or less 29 a week's gestation in human. And this is the original work of Marie Ellen Avery at that time in 67. And you see the lung is congested all over without any difference. And if you look in terms of uh, phospholipids, surfactant phospholipids are lacking all over the lung. So in every single lung lobe. So this is why you see this in every single chest zone without any difference. You cannot have RDS only on the right side or only on the left side. RDS is a primary homogeneous surfactant deficiency. So this is the picture you wanna see with the lung ultrasound when you lack of surfactant. And this will give us the possibility for the first time in the history to actually see RDS. And so to give a correct diagnosis of primary surfactant deficiency, not only by looking at the FIO2, which may be increased for many reasons like RDS, sepsis, congenital heart defects and many, many others that have nothing to do with surfactant. So um, as you may imagine, you can actually create a score starting on that, right? Because a lung with RDS may be more or less white, wider or less. So uh, there are a lot of lung ultrasound scores that have been invented in adult critical care over 15 and 20 years ago, because in the adult ICU lung ultrasound, is being used since really 20 years. So we must say that the neonatal world is very much delayed compared to that. And these lung ultrasound scores have been validated in adults, in, in invasively ventilated adults against a number of gold standard techniques. For example, the first, the most important one is the CT scan. So you see, this is an adult with ARDS and you clearly see the density here at the CT scan, and you recognize here again the confluent B lines at the, uh, at the lung ultrasound. You see here there is a different footprint because this has been done with a convex probe, which is the one used in adults. But again, if you do the correlation between the number of B lines of so the lung ultrasound score and the density at the CT scan, there is no doubt both are increasing linearly. So actually, lung ultrasound is able to give you an idea of lung aeration, to give an idea of the lung volume, which is actually open and available for the gas exchange. And uh, if you do not believe me, well, actually, there have been many, many other papers that you may see here um, in, in this review I published a couple of years ago, and lung ultrasound scores have been validated against uh, uh, ex vivo measured lung volume, transpulmonary dilution, gas exchange, we're gonna talk about that, CT scan, computerized grade scale analysis, lung mechanics, a lot of these things demonstrated that lung ultrasound scores are actually accurate. So now let's have a look at the pediatric, the neonatal lung ultrasound score, because what we did in 2014, it got published for the first time in JAMA 2015, has been just taking the basic lung ultrasound signs that are always the same all over the ages, both in neonates, in premise, in children, and in adults, and even for for in the elderly, we use them and we apply it on the newborn chest by dividing the newborn chest in three areas, as you may see here, upper anterior, lower anterior and lateral, per each chest size. So if you see here are the, um, uh, the, the four basic lung ultrasound signs uh, that I'm going to describe more in detail later, they are coded zero, one, two, three. So since you have three um, areas per each chest size, you're gonna have a total lung ultrasound score that is ranging from zero to 18. So clearly zero, it's a, it's a lung that is not diseased at all, it's a normal lung, and 18 is a completely diseased, completely non-aerated lung. So before applying these to neonates, 
we wanted to be extra sure that this score uh, would have been valid also in neonates, and particularly for sulfate and need prediction. We had no doubts about that because the physiology is always the same uh, all, all across the ages. It's the same in, in adults and it's the same in babies, but we wanted to be extra sure. So we, we double checked it. And to do that, we validated this score against the quality of surfactant. So basically we extracted surfactant from the amniotic fluid and we measured the capability of surfactant to float at the air liquid interface in microplates in my lab so clearly surfactant in the alveoli is supposed to float between the air going into the alveoli and the alveolar fluid. And you see this capacity to float is here on the y-axis and on the x-axis, we have the lung ultrasound scores. You see clearly that the higher the lung ultrasound score, the lower the uh, flotation of surfactant, so the quality of surfactant. And there's a significant relationship. But more than that, we validated lung ultrasound score against many oxygenation measures, many oxygenation metrics some of them that I already uh, showed you before, as you may see here in a large population of 150 uh, neonates and these oxygenation metrics have been calculated by uh, using appropriately calibrated transcutaneous devices. And you see that anyway, the PF ratio, oxygenation index, the ratio and the gradient are very well correlated to the Elang ultrasound score. So now let me give an excursus. Let me give a, let me tell you a couple of words about the different surfactant because this is going to be useful later for the lung ultrasound score application. So there are many surfactants around the world. You may see that in my uh, meta-analysis published in the respiratory research 2019, but not all surfactants are created equal. Unfortunately, now we have enough data to know that the pore sign concentrated surfactant is much more efficacious than any other. And this is because of the different um, uh, phospholipid profile. Uh, Professor Luca, uh, sorry to bother you. We are not able to listen to you at this moment. Professor Luca, we are not able to listen to you. I think there is a kind of, uh, connectivity problem from Professor's side, Professor De Luca's side. We'll just wait till he rectifies the problem. I think he has logged out. Yeah, right. I'll just contact him. Give me a minute. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, Professor Luca, we can hear you. I'm sorry, I got disconnected. Yes, we got uh, some connectivity problem in between. Right? No, yeah. we are also, uh, yeah. I'm gonna start again from where I was. Okay. Fine. Yeah, sure. So you see this? Uh, no, the previous slide. You, you have seen this? We are able to see your slides. Okay. So now, as you may see here, these guys in Turkey, they used the lung ultrasound score to see what was happening in terms of 
uh, lung aeration, when you use poractan alpha, so the port sign more concentrated and efficacious of surfactant, or baractant, which is a bovine and more diluted surfactant. And no surprise at all, you see that when you use poractan, the lung ultrasound score is going down, meaning that the lung is going to be more and more open, while it's plateauing somewhere with baractant with no effect at six hours. And this is exactly the same thing that is visible in terms of oxygen saturation index here on the right, which is one of these complex oxygenation metrics that I suggested you to use. And then also another uh, Turkish study showing exactly the same thing. As you may see here, the language ultrasound score is half uh, in peractan alpha group compared to, cal compared to calfactant. So basically, in our first study in JAMA 2015, we asked the lung ultrasound score to predict surfactant need. And uh, as you may see here, we have two rock curves on the right. So the blue one is for premise below 34 weeks gestation, and the yellow one is for babies above 34 weeks gestation. So the lung ultrasound score is not very well working for babies a term or near term, but actually this is not even true. This is due to the fact that there is no gold standard to compare with for sulfatan administration in term and near term babies. And also because these babies, they do not only have primary sulfatan deficiency, but they may have a mix of everything like neonatal ARDS, meconium aspiration, sepsis, TTN, and blah, blah, blah. While you're going down with gestational age, like the, the, the baby under the blue curve, you have a much more homogeneous population of babies where uh, the first cause of respiratory failure is primary sulfatan deficiency, so RDS. And this is why the lung ultrasound score is much more efficacious in premise than in bigger babies. And um, when we did that, we found more or less 90% of specificity and 90% of sensitivity to predict sulfactan need. And I remember that when we presented this data for the first time at the PIS Congress in San Diego in 2015, uh, we got criticized because some colleagues told us, well, okay, this is nice, but these are babies below 34 weeks, and we actually care for extremely low birth weight infants, so the much smaller one. So we uh, uh, went back to Paris, and we decided to do exactly the same study in smaller babies, so in babies below 28 weeks gestation. And as you may see here, we got published in Pediatrics 2018, and you see here on the left, the raw curve is more or less the same as even better, and uh, on the right side, you see the curve to predict not surfactant administration, but to predict the second surfactant dose. So the, the curve is anyway good for the second surfactant dose, but I ask you not to consider that because actually uh, we do not use almost never a second surfactant dose because when you use poor sign surfactant, the need for a second dose is extremely rare. And in that particular study, only a handful of babies actually needed a second surfactant dose. So the statistical power uh, for uh, the prediction of a second sulfatan dose is, 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 not, is not so significant. But again, with a lung ultrasound score more than six or more than eight, more or less, you get a sensitivity and a specificity of more or less 90%, which is extremely high. So let's have a look at the uh, lung ultrasound score in, in video, in real life, as you may see here. So basically you place your probe on over the uh, three uh, chest zones per each chest uh, side. And you see here when you have only A lines, so these horizontal lines below the pleura that are a reflection of the pleura because there is enough air uh, over there, you code zero because this is a totally aerated and normal lung. When you have at least three B lines, which are these um, uh, vertical comet tails lines coming down from the pleura up to the very bottom of the screen, you code three, and that's the equivalent of an interstitial edema. Very well aerated yet, but starting to have a little bit of edema. And when you have a lot of B lines that are actually confluent, as you may see here, and they are no more uh, recognizable between them, you got a, a white, totally white lung. That's a, an alveolar edema. There is a significant loss of lung aeration, you call two. And when you have this irregular image with a uh, um, irregular border, which is called red shine, with uh, hyperechogenic and hypoechogenic areas in it, that that's a consolidation. So that's um, a fully uh, non aerated lung, and you call it three. So this is our protocol. I'm sorry, this is in French. So basically, when an extremely preterm baby is coming into the NICU from the DR, and the DR is very adjacent to the NICU, we do not do anything. For the first hour of life, we only start the CPAP. We place the UVC line and eventually the, UVA, the UAC line. We start TPN and caffeine. That's what we do. All the other things like 
um, uh, uh, pressure control and the temperature and, and the measurements and so on and blah, blah, blah. This has been done later. So basically we have two hours up to the third hour of life to do our lung ultrasound, even do that twice. For example, when the lung ultrasound is done by our younger resident and you wanna have a double look, you can do that. You have two hours of time to do the two hours of time to do the lung ultrasound and decide if you can stay and play in CPAP or you gotta go for an insure. So basically we call it Esther, as you said, and um, uh, we decided to leave the FIO2 classical policy in the middle of 2016. So up to the 1st of June, 2016, we were used to give surfactant according to FIO2 threshold, but then we stopped it and we started to use lung ultrasound and we give um, uh, surfactant when we have a lung ultrasound a score more than eight. So the first paper about, about Esther that we did compared the first six months of 2016 versus the second semester of uh, 2016. And you see here on this chart on the right, the, the, the red triangles in the first semester of 2016 were all the babies that were getting surfactant late after the three hours of life, which accounts for uh, uh, not enough timely surfactant administration. But then when Esther has been introduced, you see here the arrow, you only have four babies getting late surfactant administration, thanks to Esther. And then we extended the analysis to the bull year. And I can tell you that there were no more uh, triangles. And now we are using Esther since like five years and we do not have almost any late surfactant administration. We have had one some months ago and it was an exceptional event. So Esther is extremely powerful in avoiding late surfactant administration and in increasing the timeliness of surfactant therapy in pregnant babies with RDS. And beside that, is also able to reduce the oxygen exposure because you see here in the first months, in the first six months versus the second six months, the reduction of FiO2 and also here the increment in ventilator free days, so the reduction in, in, in ventilation exposure. If you are asking yourself if this is going to increase your surfactant therapy, the answer is not because very recently, thanks to our pharmacy, we did a study over three years, so three years before Esther and three years after Esther introduction, and you see that the financial cost of surfactant in terms of number of treatments and in terms of surfactant vials has not changed it at all. So Esther increases the timeliness of surfactant therapy, but that does not increase the total surfactant consumption and financial expenditure. So it's very important to know that we are not the only one because these colleagues in Spain, they actually did a randomized controlled trial which we would be never able to do because it would be uh, unethical in my NICU. And they randomize babies to receive surfactant according to Esther or to receive surfactant according to uh, FIO2 level. And they, I was very much happy to accept it as editor of the European Journal of Pediatrics. And you see the pie chart is speaking for itself. There were, a, there were a many, many here in, in bold gray lake. Surfactant administration in the ester arm. And also, the oxygenation was very much improved in terms of SF ratio in the ester arm compared to the control group. So, let's go back to the data that I showed you before. Uh, this study uh, from Australia said that having FIO2 more than 0 0.3, a one hour of life, and an area under the cube of 0 0.81, and this is what uh, the European guidelines are referring to. But if we do the comparison, the lung ultrasound score as an area under the cube for surfactant administration 0.952, which is extremely higher compared to that, but also compared to chest X-rays, you see, which is more or less was used to be the only uh, um, chest images available in the NICU, but also very much higher to many surfactant biology tests like the The 
with a mailer ID count, the publisher actually has studies using a lot of score to predict the fact that need goes up very much consistent because you always get a sensitivity and a specificity of more or less 90%. And very recently, we have redone this meta analysis, including some studies that were not published at the time. And this new meta analysis is published in Unitology 2021. And you see here the raw curve is very much here on the left upper corner. So again, very high sensitivity and specificity. And if you do uh, the comparison again with chest film and with the uh, sulfatum biology test, again, you get here for lung ultrasound score, you see a sensitivity of more or less 88% and a specificity of more or less 95%. So extremely good um, reliability to be used in the clinical field. So the good news for you is that uh, you do not need any particular probe. The linear one is the one to be used, but if you have a linear one or a micro linear one, which is even better, for the uh, very tiny baby is the same. We did this study and got published in chess some months ago, and we challenged our resident with no experience in lung ultrasound and our fellow with one year experience and our senior to use many different uh, probes. And you see that anyway, the, the raw cube, the area under the raw cube is very, very high. And also the concordance between the, uh, between the uh, uh, physicians is pretty high. Uh, the only uh, uh, occasion when it was lower it was when um, a resident with absolutely no experience in lung ultrasound is using a convex probe, which is supposed to be the, com the, the probe to be used in adults. So that's the only thing that you don't have to do, but otherwise it's very easy um, to, uh, to learn lung ultrasound and to recognize the basic sign in order to predict surfactant, uh, surfactant need. As you know, we were used to do many uh, uh, lung ultrasound courses, both in Paris and in different countries by visiting, uh, unfortunately, as you can understand, we had to stop it because of the pandemics, but we are very much happy to do that again as soon as COVID-19 will be over. Um, and in fact, we had a project with Armenia, so with a, with a um, uh, developing country anyway, with a middle-income country, and Armenian fellows um, uh, come to Paris for a couple of days, and then they went back to Yerevan, and they started to send us images in order to control for their accuracy. And we finally demonstrated that after a short uh, training, uh, they were absolutely able, even with a broadband linear probe, to apply lung ultrasound and to uh, decide about surfactant administration. You see the uh, uh, concordance coefficient is very high. And so now they are using lung ultrasound also in Armenia. What about surfactant retreatment? I told you something about that because uh, 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 I showed you the, the rock cube we uh, uh, published in PDA in 2018. But basically, you have to um, understand one thing. When you inject sulfatan into the lung, even if you use pore sign sulfatan, which is more concentrated, you still inject a little bit of water. And it's even worse if you use baractan or other sulfatan. So you see, if you do the lung ultrasound right after, you see anyway a lot of, a, of, of B lines, okay? So the thing is that you need time and you need ventilation for the water to be reabsorbed. Uh, Luigi Catirossi at the time did this study in rabbits, and you see that the water has been reabsorbed in more or less at six hours. So these were rabbits. In human neonates, it's not exactly the same. It may be much uh, quicker, but we don't know yet. This is something we are studying right now. There are some data about the prediction of sulfate and retreatment. There are our data that I'm showing here, the one related to the rock cure that I showed you a minute ago. But as I told you, we use very few second sulfate and doses, so it's it, they, they, they have not enough reliability. And there is an Italian group also published it about that, but in a much smaller, in a much smaller population. I believe that this is difficult to predict because uh, it depends on what you are ventilating. If it's that only a baby with RDS, or you also have neonatal ARDS because there is inflammation and there is sulfate and catabolism. It depends on how many uh, prenatal steroid dose you got. And also it depends on the kinetics because you have to remember, according to the study that we did many years ago with my mentor Virgilio Carnielli, the um, half-life of the PPC, which is supposed to be the main um, lipid surfactant component, is 20 hours, 22 hours in babies getting only one dose, but it's only 10 hours in babies getting multiple doses, which means that you don't need to give a second dose before 10 hours because you already have half of your first dose over there. It makes no sense to give a second dose earlier than 10 hours if you're using poor science of factor. But this is not always uh, applied in every NICU. So the combination of all these factors makes that it's pretty difficult to predict if you actually will need the second surfactant dose. 
this is something that must be uh, uh, still studied. But it's extremely reliable and extremely advisable to use language ultrasound for the prediction of the first surfactant dose, which is the most important thing to reduce the risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia uh, early in life. So thank you very much for um, uh, your attention. I'm, I'm happy to take your question over the, the next 15 minutes. And I'm sorry for the uh, uh, bad hospital network uh, and the disconnection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor D. Luca, for this wonderful and informative uh, session on <clears throat> uh, the Esther technique. Uh, so we have some questions. So to begin with, I would uh, I would open the uh, set the ball rolling by asking you. Uh, in one score one and two, we have some presence of interstitial edema and alveolar edema. So how uh, we can differentiate uh, delayed clearance of lung fluids with uh, uh, features of HMD. So, are there think are there any uh, you know ways to differentiate these two? That's a very that's a very good question. Again, this is the reason why lung ultrasound score is extremely useful to predict surfactant need in premise. So, in babies below thirty four, as soon as you go beyond, you start to have an increasing incidence of babies with delay fluid reabsorption, so TTN, and. Uh, and, uh, and this makes a problem. This creates a problem, right? So um, this is something to be studied for babies above 34 weeks. But the influence of fluid reassertion is so small for preterm babies that you don't have to worry about that for babies below 34. You can use it without any problem. And even more for babies below 32, and which are the ones that you care the most because you want to really optimize the timeliness of the administration in order to... Uh, uh, reduce bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, thank you. And one more related question is, uh, uh, in the second hour, you have told that you use, the first hour is the stabilization, and the second hour you use uh, lung ultrasound to uh, in kind of uh, uh, deciding whether to give surfactant or not. So do you use uh, oxygen threshold or sickness level, or you always uh, tend to use lung ultrasound. As I said, as I said, we do not use at all oxygen level since June the first, two thousand and sixteen. We do not use that anymore. We only use lung ultrasound. Dr. Magla, please. Uh, thank you, sir, for the uh, excellent uh, and uh, lucid presentation. I, I cannot hear you. Uh, do you hear me? No. Uh, do you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah now, yes. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, so Good I would time. like to uh, just, uh, as an extension of uh, Dr. Uh, Sajid's question, uh, so do we have any recommended uh, time period? Like uh, when we say that, so uh, uh, we understand uh, from your presentation that uh, ultrasound helps us in uh, uh, achieving early surfactant usage, especially in that the cutoff seems to be around three hours. So but did you have any particular time point at which ultrasounds were done? Or do you think multiple ultrasounds done starting from birth? So when should we start uh, doing an ultrasound uh, after birth, say half an hour, one hour? What is your recommended uh, time there for taking addition? No, this is a false problem. Babies okay. uh, got, got lung ultrasound upon NICU admission in my unit. They come to the NICU, OK? So okay. The, fir the first urgency clearly is to place UVC or UAC line and start TPN and caffeine. And then you do lung ultrasound calmly. There is no problem. And it makes no sense to be worried about doing that at one hour or two hours. You got to do that before three hours if you really want to optimize your fight administration. That's the only thing that counts. OK, so so in case if the first ultrasound score was less than eight, so you never had a situation that this baby went to a score of more than eight when it done after an hour or say after a couple of hours? If you are enough, if you are enough proficient and you did a little bit of training, your score is low, it's is below, it's below eight. You stay in CPAP, you have absolutely no problem. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, I'd like to bring some questions that have been asked uh, uh, sure, I'm, from I'm the participants. Uh, so so, so, so uh, people have asked actually, uh, does the mode of delivery uh, matter? Like uh, people, uh, babies born through a cesarean section versus babies born through uh, vaginal. So do you have a difference in the ultrasound findings? That's a question uh, from the audience. Absolutely yes. not. The lung... Uh, Professor Diluka, uh, we're not hearing you. Hello? 
Do you hear me, you sir? Hear me? Uh, uh, sir, now we hear you. Sorry, can you just repeat yeah. the answer? Sorry, we lost you for a moment. Again, yeah, again, the lung ultrasound semiology is always the same at any age, in the elderly, in adults, in children, in neonates, in premise, born by cesarean section, born by vaginal delivery, born by other means. There is absolutely no difference. Lung ultrasound semiology only depends on the presence or absence of air into the lung tissue. Okay, sir. Uh, so there is a question people are asking about how much time it takes to do this procedure. What is the average time it takes? Uh, uh, and uh, there is also a once, question. Uh, once you are once you are expert, it takes two minutes, a couple of minutes. It may take 10 minutes in the beginning when you are not well versed, but no more than that. It's more, much more quicker and less stressful than an echocardiography because you don't have to push. You don't have to change your direction in nothing. A couple of minutes is more than enough. Uh, that's a concern from uh, uh, somebody uh, who's asking that, is there an increased risk of infection by doing an uh, early ultrasound, <laughs> uh, by bringing an ultrasound absolutely so early? Not. It's an ex absolutely not. It's an external procedure. It's absolutely non-invasive. We just uh, swipe the uh, ultrasound probe before and after one, uh, one exam, and that's all. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so people are interested in knowing that, okay, uh, uh, you showed well that in more than uh, uh, 34 weeks, these bigger babies actually maybe differential diagnosis start coming in like other diseases. So how good is uh, this uh, ultrasound? Because uh, we in developed country, uh, developing nations, we see a lot of meconium aspiration and we do use surfactant in well, those we, babies we as well. Too. Yeah. So how good is this uh, ultrasound uh, in picking up meconium aspiration and in deciding surfactant in that situation? Uh, lung ultrasound is extremely good and useful to make the diagnosis of other uh, neonatal lung disorders like uh, meconium aspiration syndrome and neonatal ARDS due to sepsis or pulmonary hemorrhage and so on. But you have to do the distinction between recognizing the disease and the lung ultrasound is very much uh, good at that or using lung ultrasound to decide the sulfite administration for those diseases. So the recognition of the disease making the diagnosis Lung ultrasound is extremely powerful. It's much more powerful than chest film. I have a lot of data about that. And this is very much consistent with the use of lung ultrasound in adult ICU. But unfortunately, I don't have the time to show you here. That's the, uh, this is gonna be the title for another webinar because it, it, that, that's too much. Conversely, it's difficult to use lung ultrasound to decide about sulfite administration for these other diseases because there is no gold standard. We don't even know if we, have to give surfactant for these other diseases. So it's a much more complex um, uh, uh, question, let's say. But I'm happy, I'm happy to talk um, uh, about meconium aspiration in Italy RDS in another, uh, in another occasion. Thank you, sir. We'll look forward to it. We will uh, definitely call you for that, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think we, we, uh, I'll just ask one more question and then I'll hand over to Dr. Sajan. Sir, uh, do you th think there is still any role for X-ray once we start using ultrasound? Do you do X-rays at all in our unit for babies uh, uh, with RDS? Almost never. Um, almost never. I didn't show you the data, but since we started the uh, lung ultrasound program, we reduced the use of chest film by 74% in my NICU. So we, we do that very rarely, basically for malformations. I don't know, you have a baby with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, you do a chest film or something like that. Otherwise, the vast majority of cases are just managed with ultrasound, with lung ultrasound and echocardiography and that's it. There were a couple of questions about sulfate administration. I'm happy to answer if you, I still have 10 minutes if you want. Yes, please, please stay. Yeah, people want to know, uh, do you, how do you kind of uh, identify babies uh, do, uh, for lung ultrasound? Do you do in all preterm babies or you kind of choose those babies? How do you choose babies for lung ultrasound? Again, every single baby that is coming in the NICU got lung ultrasound. Hello.
a sound and echocardiography. Every doctor does that for every. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We are. Uh, Did you hear me? Uh, yeah, intermittently we are losing your sound. Can, uh, we are not able to uh, listen to what you have said. Can you please repeat? Every single baby coming into the NICU, every single baby coming into the NICU is getting a lung ultrasound upon NICU admission. Every doctor can do that, and every single baby admitted to the NICU is getting lung ultrasound and even echocardiography upon NICU admission. Okay, thank you. So people have asked about, uh, what about uh, if the lung is having a heterogeneous lung findings? How do you kind of uh, go about it? Some areas showing... Uh, what do you mean? Uh, so the some areas of the lung showing different finding than the other. There are six, the lung is divided into various uh, areas. So if you have a differential finding, so um, you cannot, so you cannot have, you, can, you cannot have any dishomogeneity in RDS, in primary sulfate and deficiency. As I said, this is homogeneous. You do not have any dishomogeneity. There are other diseases when you see a uh, dishomogeneous picture, like meconium aspiration syndrome or ARDS, and that's a completely different history. Absolutely. Uh, so what, what is the ideal kind of a probe uh, to be used for uh, doing lung ultrasounds? As I said, in neonates, you need a linear probe. You can use a broadband linear probe of more or less 10 megahertz, this is okay, although you may have a little bit some problem when it comes to babies below 26 weeks, the, the, smaller, the, the smaller ones. Uh, otherwise, if you have a microlinear high frequency probe, the one that has a sort of a golf stick shape, that's perfect. And this is also the one that is used to place jugular line and brachiocephalic lines, so uh, central venous lines. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any uh, any uh, uh, guidance to the participants how they can learn the uh, you know lung ultrasound technique? Uh, they don't have a facility. To... Unfortunately, the best thing to do that is a is a course like the ones that we were used to do, and we had to stop because of the pandemics. So I hope they will be able to do that um, uh, soon again, maybe visiting India. Usually, we uh, we um, we have seen that with a couple of days of course, and then a couple of weeks of practice in the NICU, that's more than enough. The learning curve is very steep. Thank you. Uh, somebody has asked, will you give surfactant if the baby is not on uh, respiratory support, uh, but and still the lung ultrasound uh, LUS uh, score is high? There is no baby. There is there is no preterm baby that has no respiratory support. All preterm babies must be below 32 weeks. All preterm babies must be under CPAP. And anyway, if you if we have a baby under CPAP in room air, but with a lung ultrasound score beyond eight, we give him surfactant. We do the insure, and we demonstrated that this is not going to increase the total number of treatment, as I showed you in the paper published in the American Journal of Perinatology, 2019. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor Diluca. Dr. Magla, do you have any other questions? For uh, uh, sir, uh, sir, do we have time, sir? So, so, so two or three more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, if you look at uh, the randomized trial that uh, you cited uh, uh, done by the Spanish team had used a protocol of uh, 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 on one limb, I think they had only the FAO2. On the other limb, they had either the ultrasound or an FAO2, whichever comes first. So, so what do you think, mm -hmm. sir? Uh, do you face such situations where the ultrasound score is still uh, less than 8, you are cut off, but the FAO2 requirement uh, goes above 30 or 40 in a particular gestation? The, this, uh, is a, this is a false problem because these guys in Spain, exactly like my group here in Paris, they always had a higher lung ultrasound score before the FIO2 goes up. So in that arm, the lung ultrasound score was beyond eight and the FIO2 was still lower because that's how things work. That's physiology. The lung first is going to be closed and then FIO2 is going to go up. Sir, we, we lost you again. Uh, do you hear us, sir? 
And this is why if you don't use language, Did, did you hear me? Uh, sir, we are back now, sir. Sorry, there was an interruption. Now it's clear back. We are back again. Okay. So, so, okay. Did, did, I think you hear me. Uh, uh, so sorry, sir. Well, we didn't hear your answer to that question. So, so what is your suggestion? There is no need to go to FAO at all. Just it's, it's, it's no, okay. The we problem is that in, in that study, exactly like in my practice, okay. first, the Lang ultrasound score is going up. And then FIO2 is going up. And that's totally physiological because actually first the lung is going to be closed and then you observe increasing FiO2, right? So um, in the uh, Esther arm in that trial, there were babies with a very high lung ultrasound score, but still lower FiO2 and they correctly give them surfactant in order to avoid any delay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so the other question, what uh, uh, interesting question. There, is a, there is a, I'm, I'm sorry, there, there is a question. There is a question from somebody that I'm reading here that it's very important to, to answer. Somebody has understood that doing lung ultrasound means delaying surfactant for two hours. And it was worrying because surfactant should be done in the delivery room. So I want to be very clear. There is, first of all, no time point we do lung ultrasound, sometimes we give surfactant at one hour of life, sometimes at 40 minutes of life, sometimes at two hours, or two hours and a half. Okay, second point, do, do you hear me? Yes, yes, sir, please, sir. go ahead. Okay. Second point, it is not true that surfactant is better given in delivery room. It's not the place that counts. What counts is to give surfactant within the first three hours of life, right? So. Uh, it doesn't matter where you give surfactant. It matters to give surfactant before the third hour of life, according to the evidence-based data that we have. So the Cochrane meta-analysis 2012. In our case, our DR is very close to the NICU. So we just move the baby. It takes five minutes and we do everything we, we have to do. Let's imagine a different setting when you have a delivery room that is extremely far from the NICU. This is not suitable, but let's say that this is the situation where you can indeed do your lung ultrasound in the delivery room and decide if you want to do an insure in the delivery room, right? Although I personally think that it's always better in the NICU because, you know, the temperature is different. You have your incubator and so on. But it's not true that surfactant is better given in the delivery room. Surfactant is better given in the first three hours of life, irrespective of the, the, the place, actually. Oh, thank you, sir. That's clear. Uh, so there's an interesting question about uh, the scoring system. Uh, a, a, a consolidation, uh, in, uh, which is not uniform, gets a high score of three. Uh, do we expect that to happen in RDS? How good is it? Uh, uh, how commonly uh, this finding happens in RDS? Because RDS is a homogeneous disease. We are not expect, uh, expecting patchy consolidation to take place. But that seems to have a, get a higher score in the scoring system. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, in a, in a, um, let's say, classical RDS, you shouldn't give any tree. You shouldn't have any big consolidation. You may have such a small subpleural consolidation, but not big ones. And by convention, we consider it small only those that are below one centimeter. Okay. If you see a big consolidation, you better check the clinical history. You better check your procalcitonin or, or CRP. Or, or, or something like that, because you may have not only RDS, but also an infection or ARDS. So uh, it's very important to remember that the lung ultrasound findings must be integrated with the biological findings, with the clinical history to understand and to give the, the refined diagnosis. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, have you tried uh, using this for assessing? Uh, in your setting, you said actually uh, you, you don't require a second dose mostly, but we do uh, see the need for a second dose of surfactant in our settings. Uh, so, how good is ultrasound uh, uh, to assess the response to surfactant once we give a surfactant? Or, and why not use the same score to uh, uh, predict our, our uh, secretary of our going for the second dose of surfactant? Again, as I told you, it's difficult to predict the second dose of surfactant because this depends on how many prenatal steroid dose you get, how much high is the CPAP that you are using. 
how the baby is going to be ventilated, what type of surfactant you're using, what time you wait. This is extremely uh, dishomogeneous between the NICUs. Second, the effect of surfactant is very easily seen by FiO2 and saturation. You don't need lung ultrasound. Although this is something that we are studying, that we are studying right now. And regarding surfactant administration, we do not do LISA because there is absolutely no evidence about that. And you may uh, be aware of my papers in Lancet and in Seminar of Perinatology, even together with Eduardo Bancalari, criticizing LISA uh, that uh, has been published by the industry without any evidence. What we do is a real insure. And our insure is lasting on average seven minutes. So the pool, the, the tube is pulled out after on average seven minutes and the baby is again on CPAP without any problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sajan, I think uh, uh, that's all from my end. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah thank you, Professor Luca. Uh, there is an, an, another question, how to define the upper and the lower zone anteriorly for the ultrasound? What anatomical... Oh, this is, done, this is done by eye. This is not a problem. You, you, you see by eye, it's an eyeball determination uh, and it's very easy. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Luca, for this excellent uh, uh, enlightening us on this excellent, uh, you know, important topic. I uh, now hand it over to Professor, uh, to Dr. Manoj uh, for the rest of the... Uh, well, uh, uh, as we always say, uh, sweet things always need to come to an end. So again, this is the end of today's uh, session and uh, let me uh, from the whole team here thank uh, Professor Diluca uh, for such a wonderful session. Sir, your talks always are power packed and have straight <laughs> messages, sometimes very, very bland, but then they are hitting messages and uh, that is what makes your talk so powerful. Thank you so much for being with us and I am sure that you are already uh, running late for the next talk which you uh, it is uh, due at I, 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 8.30 Indian time so I, am, I think you are 7 minutes late for that. Apologies for that. Thank you so much for being with no us problem. today. We hope Thank to you. Bye have bye. you with us again. Thank you so much and we, we bye will bye uh, bye. look forward to you again. Sir. Thank you so much. Bye bye bye. Bye. Sir. And at the same time, also let me thank uh, two of my good friends, uh, Professor Srishajan Saini and Professor Mangla Bharati for moderating this session so effectively and crisply. We have a lot of questions. I can see a uh, lot more questions here, but you have uh, chosen the correct questions and asked. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. And finally, uh, uh, Respected uh, attendees, uh, of course, it is a pleasure to have you again with us uh, uh, for this 24th webinar in our series. Uh, this month, uh, as, I, as we were uh, saying previously, February, March were supposed to be neonatal hemodynamics, but we wanted to have Esther talk by uh, Professor Diluca, and then this is the date he gave. That's why we kept the talk on that. So please do join us again. Thank you so much. And then please do join us again for the next session that is on 9th March. We continue with uh, neonatal hemodynamics. This is going to be a very, a very interesting talk by Professor Mc, uh, Patrick McNamara on the right drug at the right time. So until then, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good night.